Great. Okay. Great. Hey, folks. Hey, it's 12, 12 o'clock. It's noon here on the West Coast. I don't know where you folks are, but uh, it's a beautiful day here on the West Coast. And uh, this is Bert Sperling. Bert Sperling with Sperling's Best Places. And we're going to have another uh, live presentation of, um, well, some things about best places to live. So let me go ahead and um, say that it's uh, Tuesday and it's the uh, second day of August and uh, summer is more than half done, at least if you're looking for um, measuring it by going back to school and that sort of thing. And uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, we're having a really nice summer. I hope you're having good summer wherever you are. You know, some places like Maryland is having awful weather, uh, disastrous, catastrophic weather. Anyway, my heart goes out to you folks, and I hope you recover soon. Um, the uh, place of Ellicott City, uh, we've chosen that before uh, in some lists, a very livable place. Uh, that whole area, Maryland, um, is uh, really up and coming, and um, it's really doing well as far as livability. This is a real disaster. I hope uh, things recover very well. Uh, we have a new study coming out soon. It's uh, called the Wrinkle Ranking. It's all about how um, you're affected where you live. Uh, and this is uh, looking at the premature damage from skin, um, skin conditions, uh, the different factors like the um, humidity, the lack of, uh, lack of humidity, the dryness, uh, the sun exposure, commuting has, a, uh, has an issue, uh, toxins in the air, air pollution, all of that has a, an effect on your skin. And we, in the last couple of years, we did a couple of studies with Rock Cosmetics. That's R-O-C Cosmetics. And um, looking at the different cities and how they're affected uh, by premature skin damage. So we developed something we uh, humorously call the wrinkle ranking. And so one of the things that we went ahead and looked at, uh, we went into the future about um, 25 years to the year 2040 to see what might be changing uh, as far as the demographics uh, and um, the climate and many other type of things. Uh, one of the things that we saw was that the demographics are changing a lot. Uh, basically, there is going to be more and more people of color. And when it comes to skin and skin care, this is actually um, very good as far as the uh, reducing the amount of skin damage because uh, white folks of European extraction, like myself, are much more at risk from melanoma, uh, which is a type of skin cancer and also uh, from uh, premature wrinkling. So um, uh, what we're, we're finding is that uh, Asians to have uh, a lesser extent than uh, say white folks, Caucasians, uh, and then Hispanics, even less than Asians, and then finally uh, blacks have much less uh, of an issue with uh, melanoma which, of course, uh, you know, sociologists will tell you why their skin's darker. Anyway, it's pretty interesting how things have changed. That study's going to come out in a little bit, and uh, it'll be pretty interesting to see how the different cities are going to be changing in the next 25 years. Uh, we also have a new study coming up for over 10 years, if you can believe it. We have been doing a study with Trojan. Uh, Trojan is the condom company. And uh, I think it's a little odd sometimes uh, talking about all this sort of stuff, but uh, we're researchers, that that's what we do. We have a look at uh, 140 of the largest colleges around the United States. And what we've found uh, is we've looked at the healthcare centers, uh, the student health centers, and the type of information they are providing to the students so they can be healthy, and smart and make their own best decisions when it comes to um, sexual activity. So we've been looking at that and rating what kind of information is available. And the students have really embraced it. 
Uh, there's nothing like this, this study. Uh, Trojan really believes in it. Uh, like I said, this is the 11th year that we've done it. And um, it is a really a very uh, sort of a powerful tool for the students who have actually gone to the administration and say, look, we need to change things for ourselves because here's how we compare with other um, colleges like us around the country. So we're happy to do that. We're wrapping that up. Now, also on our website, bestplaces.net, we have some interactive maps that are really cool. Nick Arnold, who is our cartographer, uh, I got a funny story about cartographer, but uh, I'll circle back to that. So anyway, Nick Arnold, uh, who's a, a, a recent graduate, and um, he is doing a great job on our interactive maps. Uh, basically, you go to our website, and uh, you go to, into one of the places, and in all the categories, like cost of living, housing, or whatever, there are these maps that show what are called coral pleth uh, maps. And what they do is they fill in the areas based on the values. So you have this sort of jigsaw puzzle of different colors that shows you exactly where housing is more and less affordable, uh, where the different uh, climate, um, so rainfall, precipitation, uh, how those are. Uh, you look at the demographics of an area uh, where, say, the most people live that are, say, have uh, um, higher education levels and less educated, and which where people are making more money. All that information on interactive maps, you can play with them. Anyway, we're very proud of that. I hope you like it. Um, and we have a new data set coming up. Uh, so this is going to be pretty exciting, too. New data set. Anyway, before we circle, oh, I was going to talk about cartographer. So Nick, our cartographer, which means a map guy, uh, he is going to go to some convention. He's talking to someone at the airport, and the person asks, so uh, what is it you do? And he says, well, I'm a cartographer. And he says, oh, so you take pictures of automobiles. <laughs> so <laughs> I couldn't make that stuff up. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. But a cartographer is a map maker. And today, map making means doing a lot of stuff on the internet uh, and uh, with uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems. So he does a lot of that, and he's really doing a great job on our site. Go to our site, check it out, bestplaces.net. So uh, let's go ahead and take some of your questions. I really like this because I learn as much from you as hopefully that you learn from me. Uh, we got one from Deb. Uh, who says, thanks, love your shows. Thanks very much, Deb. She was wondering if we could talk a little about, about the Central Oregon area. Uh, she's thinking about the Bend area. Uh, she says, we presumably, her and her husband, are, uh, visited the Bend area several times over the past few years. Uh, it's beautiful. It seems to have nice, moderate climate. Uh, their concern is that it's grown immensely in the last few years. Uh, I wonder if it will be able to keep up and not turn into a community of urban sprawl. Uh, the Redmond area, uh, which is close by Ben, um, doesn't have the same visual and geographic appeal. What do you think of Sisters? Uh, and should we look at Corvallis? And um, they're younger retirees, about the age of 60, and the prior priorities are weather. Uh, they want sunshine and a vibrant community with decent transportation. Uh, they also ask, what is the weather like in coastal towns? And she assumes that most days are pretty cloudy. Yeah, they are very cloudy. Um, so let's see. Basically, let's go talk a little about ge geography on the whole West Coast. On the West Coast here, um, we basically have uh, the Pacific Ocean, which is moderates the temperature quite a bit. Uh, so you're going to have more moderate temperature uh, along the coast. And it's going to be more extreme as you go inland. And the rain is going to come from the from, come from the coast. And I'm not talking all the way from California up through Washington. And what happens is it drops that rain as it goes inland. So you're going to have a, a, a more rain on the coast. And as you go further and further in, it gets very dry. So the California Central Valley is dry. Uh, in Oregon, you have the Bend area. Uh, and basically, Oregon is kind of unusual and much of Washington as well, where you have rain on the, on the um, west side of the state. And as you go further in, ranges of mountains 
cause the clouds to drop their rain, and then it gets drier and drier until you actually reach sort of a high desert area. So in Oregon and Washington, you think of it the rainy Northwest, but a lot of the states, Washington and Oregon, are also uh, very much of a desert kind of environment. Not the kind of desert where you're gonna see cattle skulls and cacti like you do down in the, in the Southwest, but um, they're desert like uh, scrub brush um, and uh, that sort of thing. So it's gonna be much drier and it's gonna be sunnier. So if you need sun, that's uh, definitely has an advantage there. So uh, Deb was wondering about the bend area and it's grown quite a bit. And what's happened is, uh, in fact, um, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the, the uh, Deschutes County, which is the county of Bend, had grown more than any county in the United States, fastest growing county in the US. That's a problem. Whenever you have things that are growing rapidly, it puts a lot of pressure on all of the systems uh, to keep up. So basically that's a problem. Um, but Bend has handled it very well and it's growing fast. It's a really nice city. Uh, it certainly reminds me of Orange County, of California in that it seems uh, tending towards the conservative side, um, but they're getting more younger people there. They're having uh, some campuses of Oregon State University and to a lesser extent, University of Oregon. Uh, the high, some high tech companies are finding it advantage, uh, advantageous to locate there because um, it's easy to attract really good people. Uh, things are really, um, it's a great outdoor spot. If you love mountain biking, uh, kayaking, uh, uh, hiking, climbing, all these things, uh, this is skiing, it's a great place to be. Um, it is ra rapidly becoming less and less affordable because any great place, uh, once it's discovered, is going to become less and less affordable. Uh, so that is kind of a problem. Sisters is usually considered by people too far away from the Bend area, um, but that's a place, if you're a retiree, you don't have to be really close to where the action is as if you were having a job downtown. So you won't have a longer commute. I think Sisters is a good uh, place to take a look at. And on the Oregon coast uh, and the Washington coast, it is kind of, um, it's usually a depressed economy. There's not a lot going on on the uh, Oregon and Washington coasts as far as, um, um, I guess, economic vitality. Uh, it depends on tourists and people with second homes. Generally not a good spot to be in because you're kind of at the mercy of things. So things are pretty depressed on the Oregon coast. And um, it's worthwhile checking out. Uh, housing prices are still, somewhat depressed there, uh, or along with the rest of the economy. But I'll tell you, Oregon and Seattle's already been discovered in the 90s, but basically the Northwest right now is pretty much on fire uh, when it comes to um, uh, the economy. Uh, everyone seems to be flocking to uh, Oregon and to a lesser extent Seattle. Seattle has already gone through this boom and now they are there's a lot of high tech, uh, mature high tech that's going in. Um, large firms are doing a lot uh, of um, development there uh, and things are gonna keep happening uh, as, as far as this area. This is a boom I think that is not going to really bust at all. It's simply, if, it, if the boom is gonna go up, it's really not gonna uh, correct too badly. So if you wanna live over in the Northwest, now is the time to check it out uh, because um, I think that it's just going to become less and less affordable. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Portland becomes another San Francisco uh, and uh, it's about maybe 15, 20 years in its development cycle uh, from where Seattle was. Tacoma is a great spot. There are places around Portland that are still affordable. Uh, so if you're thinking of moving to the Northwest, Check them out, get them while they're still affordable. Otherwise, um, uh, I think maybe in 20 years, 10 years even, uh, it's, it's going to be it's going to be pretty rough. But anyway, 
Uh, let's go ahead and um, talk uh, a little bit more here. I see that we have a comment from Peter who went ahead and asked about, um, well, no, let's see. Peter had a comment about the climate index. Well, let's, let's go ahead and talk about the climate index. What we have on our site is a climate index. And it's not as good as I would like. Uh, basically, what we do is we look at the amount of discomfort looking at the high temperatures. And that's okay, but the problem is how do we have a climate index that also measures how comfortable the climate is in the winter? Part of the problem I have is that some people want a winter climate like uh, Hawaii, so we're, you know, where it rarely drops below 60 degrees. Uh, to a lot of people, that's perfect. Uh, other people uh, want a climate that uh, has some rain, uh, has four seasons. People love the snow. Uh, not everybody wants to live in San Diego or Honolulu. So the problem is how do we go ahead and really construct something where it gives people an, uh, an idea of uh, what is livable. So what I would like from you is if you have some suggestions on what you find to be livable and enjoyable. Um, as far as climate, I'd love to hear from you because I'm open to suggestions uh, on how we would go ahead and do that. Um, so let's see, um, I think Pam is writing in and she says, uh, near Bend, where is good for retirement? Uh, I would say look on the outskirts of Bend, uh, Bend in town is becoming less and less affordable. So look at the Redmond area, look at sisters, look at areas around there. Uh, but it's uh, certainly going to be um, uh, going to be growing quite a bit. Uh, um, Pam also writes uh, in our chat window here. So no Northwest if renting right. Uh, well, no, I think things are still. Um, well, here in Portland, things have really gotten uh, very expensive. I think for a one bedroom now, people are talking about fourteen hundred dollars uh, an average um, for an average unit. I've seen houses being rented for four thousand, five thousand dollars a month. Uh, it used to be where um, someone, if they wanted to start a band or whatever, they could get a place for seven hundred dollars and get a bunch of their friends uh, rent a spot and everybody could live uh, cheaply. Uh, I think those days are pretty well over. But um, there are some places uh, that are still, I hesitate to say affordable, because affordable, of course, varies based on exactly you know, what your circumstances are. Um, but um, I would say, yeah, there are definitely places here in the Northwest that are still, you can still rent and afford something. But the problem is um, where exactly. And it's just like every place in the US. Some places are more expensive than others in any particular town. Uh, Rob writes in and says the best place to purchase in the US for $75,000. Wow, that's tough. What you hope to do, Rob, is you want to take advantage of places that have corrected and the price is lower than it should be, and it's, it's on its way back up. Florida used to be that way, and uh, all of what we jokingly call the sand states uh, seem to have hit really hard, um, and that was in the recession, uh, in the, the housing bust in the year, say, 2007, 2008. So what happened in those days is that they had big corrections in places like Florida, Arizona, uh, the Central Valley of California, especially, and um, Las Vegas and Nevada. So what you want to do, Rob, is look in those areas where things are still uh, at quite a, quite a dip. Check out our website, bestplaces.net. You'll see housing prices. There are some places uh, in, like, Mississippi. Um, also, one thing that, you know, a place that's never really recovered is uh, very much at all is the Central Valley of California. Stockton, uh, Modesto, 
But everything on the price, those are only cheap by West Coast standards. Everything on the West Coast is pretty expensive. And that's why Portland is taking off right now. And a lot of Oregon, uh, people sort of overlooked it. There wasn't a lot going on. And frankly, in the, in the 70s and 80s, it was just sort of a big hick uh, lumber town, uh, really nothing very interesting to do, and uh, but it's gotten a lot and uh, much more um, interesting these days, and um, so that's why more and more people are flocking to to uh, to Oregon. But you know, for seventy five thousand uh, dollars, Rob, um, I will um, I would go ahead and take a look at, at basically the South, more or less the Deep South, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, parts of Louisiana. Uh, there are places that are that cheap. <laughs> Rob says, I hate the humidity. Well, that's okay. And then we're, then we're going to have problems there. But hey, try the Ozarks. The Ozarks have um, in Arkansas, they have enough of an altitude, uh, say 2,000 feet or so. You're not going to have a lot uh, as far as humidity. And also maybe along the Smoky Mountains, uh, Asheville has gotten really expensive, um, but uh, there might be places um, that are higher up that you can go go to. Um, let's see. And Rob says he was from West Lynn, Oregon. Yeah, uh, West Lynn is taken off. It's a suburb. It's a small town just south of Portland. It's taken off quite a bit. Our cartographer guy, our map guy, uh, Nick. And his wife lived there, and they're uh, recently moved there, and they they're loving it. Uh, so it's very cool. Um, so let me see what else. Uh, any other question? Anyway, um, anyway, I was very impressed with the Ozarks, uh, and basically the Bentonville area, the Fayetteville area, uh, things are really doing well. That is where Walmart is based, and as such, they have things like the uh, Crystal. Is it the Crystal Bridge, um, Crystal something, uh, art museum? Uh, I, uh, my wife and I took a look at that last year on our long uh, trip through the Deep South, and it's an amazing art museum. So interesting things are happening there in the Fayetteville, uh, Bentonville area. So take a look at that. Uh, and any college towns uh, are very, all, always very cool as well. So anyway, Peter writes and says that the climate index is flawed, um, and he offers some very good suggestions. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, take that. If you have any sort of suggestions on the um, uh, climate and how we might measure that, uh, we have a database of all the temperatures every day of the year, what the normal temperature is for the high and the low. And I'm thinking of doing something looking at the number of days where it goes below a certain temperature at night and then a number of days where it goes below a certain number of degrees during the day but even during the summertime we don't want that temperature to stay high because what happens is you want to cool off at night you want to be able to open up your windows um, and not rely on air conditioning uh, for everything but you want to be able to open up your windows at night or go out at night and still have it cool enough that you can recover from the heat. Uh, medical experts talk about um, heat stroke and that sort of thing. They talk about the importance of having a cool night uh, a, as a way to recover from the temperature during the daytime. So we'll, I think something like that might be a good thing to look at as well. We also have humidity data. So if you're interested in uh, helping me out uh, and uh, getting a, a better climate index, I'd love to go ahead and hear from you and uh, see what you can offer us on that. So let me just go ahead and take a look at um, our chat window here. Um, let's see, what outside of ne Mexico, uh, New Mexico, what outside of New Mexico, Doreen writes in, how about New Mexico outside of the expense of Santa Fe? Yeah, San, San Jose is expensive. It's really, really nice. State capital, which is always a big plus. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Ah, yes. The official Sperling's Best Places mug. And uh, so, um, anyway, we have some great tap water here in, uh, in Portland. <clears throat> so, 
Anyway, um, <clears throat> we have uh, what outside? Uh, let's see. I think it's Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico, is uh, very good. It, that is pretty close to El Paso, just across the border from El Paso. El Paso is another great spot. Um, I I keep coming back to El Paso. I was there on a visit. They uh, they um, asked me to come down and take a look at the area. I spent uh, maybe three or four days down there uh, looking around, and uh, the people are warm and welcoming. Uh, I think and, uh, it does get hot, but it's also high desert, so it cools off more. Apparently, they have a lot of water available because of the way the water table is, um, is uh, constructed uh, geologically. That, so they are, are very unlikely, from what I understand, to be running out of water, which is going to be important uh, in the future. Uh, and um, the economy is coming back. That was the one problem I had with El Paso. Um, um, and um, so I think that that's uh, the, in El Paso, the, the climate, excuse me, the climate's coming back nicely. And uh, it's very strong these days. It's uh, now equivalent to what the standard is in the U.S. And um, so I think good things are going to be happening there. You should definitely check out El Paso for something affordable. It is a little bit isolated, but it is also uh, very livable. Um, it's right across the border from Juarez. Uh, that is not as much of a problem as you might think. Um, at one point, Juar or Juarez had a hugely high crime rate because of drug wars. That has moderated and has never gone uh, across the border to be a problem uh, with El Paso. In fact, El Paso, if you look at it, it has a very, very low crime rate um, compared to other major cities in the U.S. So uh, what I've been told, and this is sort of, I think, interesting, maybe also in light of what we've been hearing as part of the presidential campaign. Um, it, uh, I think El Paso maybe has like, is it like 80% Hispanic, I believe, and many of them are, well, I don't know, I, I, I shouldn't say many, but a number of them are recent immigrants. Basically, new immigrants to the United States, it seems, have very little to do with a high crime rate. Basically, uh, new immigrants are very, they feel very fortunate to be here in the U.S. and they do not want to screw things up for their new country. And they love our new country. And that's part of one of the reasons why the crime rate is so low in El Paso. So take a look at El Paso. And you know, I went ahead and misspoke before I said Los Alamos. I meant Las Cruces. Las Cruces, New Mexico is a great place to take a look at, right across the border from El Paso, which is a major metropolitan area. So take a look at Las Cruces. Uh, Los Alamos is also very good as well, but that's uh, sort of a different standard of living there as well. But Las Cruces, take a look at that uh, in New Mexico. Uh, let's see. Someone uh, had written about Austin versus Raleigh. Uh, which would you say, Andy writes in Austin versus Raleigh, which would you say is a better place to relocate right now? Both, um, well, I have a friend of mine who's a, uh, he's a steel guitar player uh, down in the Austin area. He says Austin has gotten completely crazy and it is sort of off the charts as far as its growth. It's very popular. Uh, it's like the San Francisco of uh, Texas. If, if Texas had a town like San Francisco, kind of quirky and hippie-like or whatever, it would be Austin. And um, so I love Austin. It's very cool. Uh, as far as the city, it's fast becoming maybe a little out of control as far as its growth, its prices, commute, uh, trying to get from one place to another. Um, I would take a look at Raleigh. There are lots of places around Raleigh that I think are very cool. In fact, someone wrote and asked about what about the area around Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. And uh, basically, they have uh, around Raleigh, they have, um, they call it the Raleigh Durham metropolitan area. 
uh, and it's called the Research Triangle Park, and they have some research facilities there. And it involves, uh, you have Raleigh, you have Durham, you have Cary, and I can't remember the other one that I'm thinking of, Durham, I guess. But anyway, uh, so they have these areas around Raleigh. Raleigh's the big metro area, and then they have small areas. My favorite of the area, when we took our road trip and uh, we spent some time looking at the various areas, uh, Cary is a bit like sort of Orange County, uh, it seems sort of, and um, I think Rob was familiar with Lake Oswego, it's sort of like Lake Oswego, it's sort of like uh, uh, maybe Bend, where it's more upscale, um, and it doesn't have, it's more of a suburb kind of area. Uh, I didn't feel like there was a lot happening there. Um, Raleigh's a, a much bigger city, but my pick would be Durham. I really like the Durham area. Uh, it has a lot of really neat old um, tobacco um, uh, storage places and factories where they used to uh, uh, do lots of products, uh, tobacco products back in the day. And it just has sort of a more interesting sort of gritty feel uh, in the area. So if I was gonna go to the Raleigh area, I'd maybe check out Durham for sure. And of course, Raleigh being so large has lots of interesting neighborhoods, livable, uh, the climate's great. About 10 years ago, it was on everybody's hot list. It has faded somewhat, which is actually a good thing because you don't want to always um, uh, try, and, uh, try and have to try and date the, the prettiest girl in, in the class or whatever if everybody else is, is lining up as well to, to go ahead and hope to, to get um, some of her attention or whatever. Anyway, that's a bad analogy. Um, but like Portland is kind of over the top as far as its um, popularity and it's very tough to find anything affordable here. Um, Austin is also pretty crazy, but when it comes to Raleigh, I think it, um, people are, it might be that people are sort of overlooking it. Asheville is another place uh, but that's very popular. It's a small town. It didn't impress me quite as much as I thought it did. Um, we've got a friend, uh, and he's a very cool guy. Uh, Owen moved from San Francisco in software design. He ended up moving to Asheville. So I'm looking forward to checking in with Owen here shortly. He's lived in Asheville for about a year. He can give us some perspective, having lived in San Francisco, moving to Asheville, he can tell us exactly what people can expect uh, compared to, say, larger cities of reference. So I'm really looking forward to talking to Owen. And when I do, in fact, maybe we can get him here on the Hangout and uh, he can talk to everybody live and uh, we can get his own take on it. That'd be very cool. Um, let's see. What else are people saying? Um, One thing about Austin, uh, Andy said uh, he's a musician. That's cool. Austin does have uh, some very, very a great music scene. Let me tell you, I was uh, talking with a guy here and uh, uh, a guy named, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, anyway, uh, he was here working in a guitar store here in uh, the Portland area. And we talked about where he had worked and, and uh, as a musician, and he'd been everywhere. He was playing blues, uh, lead guitar uh, for a blues band here in Portland. And anyway, he was working for Guitar Center, which is like a soul-crushing gig for a musician to have to go through that. And he said, well, I'm going to have to finally move to Austin and try and make something happen. Well, now uh, his name is Jacob Peterson. I think he goes by a different last name for whatever reason. But Jacob is now the lead guitar player for the Steve Miller Band. So you can look him up and see him um, on YouTube. Uh, so he made things happen by going to Austin. You can really make a difference in your life sometimes by going to a completely different city and taking advantage of what that has to offer. So anyway, Jacob is absolutely crushing it as a musician, of course, being with Steve Miller Band. Um, so uh, anyway, I'd uh, love to get his take sometime on 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 what he's found in the different places around there. Uh, let's see, so what else uh, do we have here? Um, 
Yeah, Rob says Asheville is California prices. Yeah, great weather, uh, California price. It is very spending. It's very, very popular. Asheville is for retirees. Retirees come in, they, the wealthiest segment of the population are people, say, 50 to 60 years old. They're right at the peak of their earning potential. They've dialed back. Uh, the kids are, um, have hopefully moved away. Uh, and so basically they're, they're just sort of putting their money away and they have more money at that point in their life than any other time. Um, after they retire, of course, they don't have that income, but this is before. So by the time they retire, they've put some money away and they've sold their house maybe in a more expensive place like LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, whatever. And then they come and they <laughs> raise up the housing prices for everybody else and sort of screw up the whole market. So um, that's what's happening in Asheville. A lot of people retiring to that. Um, for better or for worse, uh, that's what's happening. And sort of the whole area is being gentrified. And hey, you can gentrify a town just as much as you can gentrify uh, a neighborhood. And that's what's happening in a lot of places. Uh, things are becoming just um, more and more expensive and they are sort of becoming gentrified. Um, and that's what's happening in places like Asheville and Austin too. I think. Uh, Rob talks about uh, the Oregon coast, the Tillamook area, is still affordable. In fact, you know, almost every area on the Oregon coast is affordable uh, comparatively. Um, it is, uh, there's, sometimes there's not a lot to do there. And if I haven't told this story before, let me go ahead and tell it now. And this is, let me just close the door. It looks like we've got some workers outside. Okay, maybe that'll be a little bit quieter. Uh, looks like the neighbors are getting their uh, new roof put on their house. So anyway, uh, my wife and I were down in um, on the southern Oregon coast where there's not a lot down there, except for you folks that are golfers, the Bandon Dunes Golf Course there is probably the best golf course uh, people have said in the entire world. Uh, is there on the southern Oregon coast. So for some people, that's enough of a reason. If you live to golf, um, you've probably been at the at the Bandon Dunes, anyway, in the town of Bandon. So anyway, we're down in the southern Oregon coast, my wife and I, and we're talking to uh, a real estate agent. He says, you know, I keep selling the same house over and over again. And I thought, huh, well, that's interesting. So I say, can you tell me some more about that? And he says, um, yeah, what happens is there's a, like, there's a house on the, on, the, on the edge of the water. Uh, and it's more than anybody around here can afford. It's usually a big house. Prices are more expensive. And it takes a lot to up, uh, keep up. Um, like the, on the Oregon coast, the, the water is uh, extreme. We have winds of 100 miles per hour. Uh, the salt uh, and everything. So it's an expensive house. People uh, retire. They move from um, San Francisco or New York, wherever, and they move there and they're going to see the ocean and they're going to be part of nature. Uh, they're going to love the community. It's a small community. They maybe the community has two restaurants, a, um, sort of a, a breakfast spot, breakfast and lunch, and maybe a tavern that has pizza once in a while or whatever but so they think that's not a problem they're going to get used to that uh, and they love to cook anyway. and then the kids are going to come see them and the grandkids and, and the friends and it's going to be wonderful well but here's the reality um, first of all it's like three or four hours away from a major airport the kids have soccer during the summertime uh, it's too far for friends really to see them uh, they get really tired of the same um, restaurant over and over again if you want to call those a restaurant they're just sort of a uh, cafe and uh, finally health issues set in uh, let's face it we all get um, older and we have problems uh, there might be um, heart issues cancer dialysis uh, whatever but they, people then need to be near a, say, major health facility. 
and those are maybe three or four hours away, say in in uh, in the valley in Portland. So what happens is that same house goes on sale again uh, every five or six years, over and over again. So that's what happens on the on the Oregon coast. Um, and it happens a lot in other areas like that. Uh, so that same sort of, um, I guess, arc uh, of buying and selling happens uh, as well. Let me go ahead and see what other sort of comments we have here. Um, let's see. Someone says Durham is great. Um, Rob agrees that uh, Doreen says Austin is out of control. It was beautiful two decades ago. Yeah. Uh, John gives me a reality check. Whoever thinks the Ozarks offers a temperate climate, not. The hills are pretty low, so not much relief as one would think. Um, uh, don't like humidity. It's called snow and ice in the winter, uh, up I-44. Yeah. Um, let's face it. As far as humidity, if you don't want humidity, go w to the west side of the U.S. Okay, because here's what's going to happen. Basically, we have the Continental Divide. The Continental Divide is basically the Rocky Mountains, and it divides the continent, hence the term <laughs> Continental Divide, duh, and it divides the east from the west. So you have the spine of mountains. And basically what those mountains do is it keeps all of the humidity from the Gulf Coast. The Gulf Coast is like a giant big bathtub or the Gulf of Mexico is a, like a giant warm, humid bathtub that is um, making everything on the East Coast, the whole Eastern side of the US moist. So if you don't want that humidity, go to the West Coast. So anything west of the Continental Divide is going to be a lot drier. Anything east of it, no matter where you are, Ozarks, anywhere, uh, the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, uh, up through Boston, uh, everywhere is going to be much more moist uh, and humid compared to the western U.S. So that's just a, a flat rule of thumb. Um, but some places are going to, be, the higher the altitude, you are going to find some relief and it's going to be more relief than you'd find otherwise. But um, that's, that's, that's my rule of thumb. Doreen says, fall is pathetic here. Um, I don't know where uh, Doreen is from. Maybe she's uh, somewhere in Texas. Um, and yeah, uh, it can be brutal. That's one thing anywhere in Texas, pretty much, uh, you can have some extreme weather. It can be really, really hot and uncomfortable. If you're closer to the um, seashore on the Gulf Coast, uh, it's going to be hot as well, uh, humid as well as hot, and it's going to be pretty brutal, um, like, say, uh, Houston. Um, let's see. Let's see what else we have. Um, yeah, they talk about Brookings. Brookings, Oregon, is the is a, is a very weird area on the U, on the Oregon coast. It's down south. It's near Bandon, um, and just across the California border. And for some inexplicable reason, meteorologists probably know why, but the way it's angled or the way the the weather works, you can have temperatures. In the middle of winter, 75, 80 degrees for some weird reason, um, when the rest of the state might be 30 degrees or 40 degrees. Uh, and uh, during the rest of the year, it's also, well, it's variable. It depends. It doesn't get certainly into 100 or whatever. It's always on the coast and always stays pretty low. But for some reason, it is uh, an odd situation there. Um, now, Lori uh, wrote in about she is interested about migraines. Um, I did a study. I was hired by maybe it was Santa Fe of Aventus, uh, which is uh, one of the drug companies. I forget the name of the drug company, but 
we tried to find the, the <clears throat> migraine hotspots, the places that are most affected uh, or th that are most likely to cause migraine triggers. Um, and the problem with migraines is, of course, besides the crippling, excruciating, debilitating pain that it causes the sufferers, is that it is very variable and different people have different triggers as to what causes it. So it's uh, difficult, it's challenging to go ahead and say this is this will be a bad spot or a good spot for you as a migraine sufferer. That said, uh, if you go to our site, I think we have a, um, a study called My, uh, um, migraine, migraine Hotspots, something like that, on our website. Look up migraine on our website. It has a whole study of what we looked at and the different factors. Uh, that's a good way to go ahead and look at it. Uh, Lori says that uh, she's right about high humidity, high wind, stormy weather, extremely dry conditions, bright lights, sun glare, barometric pressure was one of the things that we found talking to experts. So basically you want to be away from places that have a lot of this sort of extreme weather. Um, and I think that would involve a lot of the Midwest. Uh, here in the Northwest, on the West Coast, the weather is usually very mild. We don't have tornadoes. Uh, we do have the occasional earthquake, and we're all waiting for the big one. We don't know when that's going to hit. But uh, for right now, we're enjoying the sort of mild climate that we have. And even in the Northwest, where things are very rainy and drizzly, uh, it's all very calm. We don't have, uh, I think I mentioned tornadoes. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have hailstorms um, of any, any of any incidents, any frequency to be concerning. So the, I would think to a migraine sufferer, this might be pretty good. Uh, cloudy, um, cloudy conditions, we do have a lot of that. So anyway, uh, I would think about that, Lori. Look for places that don't have much in the way of uh, thunderstorms and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, Here's a good one. Oh, Pam, I think, writes and says, I'm overwhelmed by all the ways to access information and choosing a place to live, which for me is anywhere in the U.S. Well, it's lucky, Pam, you, you know, you can move anywhere and have that whole options. But here's the problem. Pam has so many options uh, that um, she says, how do I take my personal criteria and whittle down my choices to a handful of locations appropriate for me without obsessing on all the details? Boy, that's a great, a great question. Part of the problem with the internet is that there's so much information that it is very difficult to uh, try and get any answers. And that's where hopefully <laughs> someone like myself and our website, bestplaces.net, can help you out. I would do this. I would, you know, take our quiz, take uh, look at other sites and what they recommend as far as and use those as a suggestion. Now, they're not going to be perfect for you, but they might sort of lead you to a new way of thinking and lead, lead you in a direction or a, a part of the country you hadn't thought about before. Like I mentioned the Ozarks. I mentioned um, uh, Florida as far as still having some affordable housing. Uh, you know, we talk about um, El Paso as being another place across the border. Uh, Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico, uh, some of the places in the California Central Valley is being affordable. Now they might not be, they're going to be still pretty grim places to live because the economy hasn't come back uh, and that's going to be a problem. And everything on the West Coast being less affordable. So there's some rules of thumb you can sort of follow that might help you sort of home in on those areas. And you can probably find a place that is just right for you once you've determined sort of the region. Because one thing I found out is that every metro area, every city, uh, every location, you're gonna have places that are, you're gonna have some places that are unsafe, that have a higher crime rate. You're gonna have some places that are too expensive, that have big fancy homes. Uh, you're gonna have places that are gonna be maybe in the suburbs, and they don't have any sort of, um, 
interesting shops or restaurants or stores available. You're going to have to drive everywhere. Uh, you're going to have places that are going to be too hot or too wet, or whatever like that. But if you get a region, you're going to find places in that area that would probably fit you pretty well as far as like affordability and everything like that. Um, oh, I got two ideas. Um, first of all, um, there's a site called meetup.com, M-E-E-T-U-P.com, meetup. So what it is, it's a worldwide site and it's grown over the last few years and now it has all this information. And there are people just like you, probably in some place you're interested and you can meet them online uh, you can read about what they're doing and get an idea of what that community like and what what people like you are doing in those places. Are there any places or are, are there any people like me who are interested in photography? Uh, we, my, my wife Gretchen and I, we went to a party uh, with some new friends and um, they had um, tango. Uh, so what they did was they had someone with a bunch of uh, old uh, tango records uh, and uh, everyone cleaned out the, uh, the large uh, living room in their house. And so they had probably maybe 15 or so couples um, uh, dancing the tango. And they do that every once in a while. And that's the kind of information you'll find on meetup.com. And you can go ahead and see just how you might integrate right into that area. And you can actually then even talk to the people and uh, uh, online and even before moving there or visiting there, um, get a lot of idea of what people are like and what they're doing and how you would fit in. And the other thing is Airbnb. Now, on our site, uh, bestplaces.net, um, Airbnb reached out to us because uh, they like what we're doing and we, they thought we would be a good partner. Um, and they asked us to put a link to their site. And we get a dollar or two uh, when people click over and actually um, set up a reservation. Uh, so there is there is that. Um, but most of all, Airbnb is a great way to test drive a home in the neighborhood and city that you might be interested in. So sure, you could go to um, you could go to a motel and stay and that sort of thing. And that's good, but motels and hotels are usually in an area with other motels and hotels in a sort of commercial area. They often they don't allow hotels right in the middle of a neighborhood. So if you're interested in living in a particular uh, place, if you want to visit it, see what it'd be like for you, and of course talk to the host uh, that is um, whose home you're going to be staying in. Uh, you can certainly do that, and uh, he or she can hook you up with. Um, some of the things to do around there. But for a, a very a, a relatively small amount compared to a hotel room, you could actually be staying in uh, the actual uh, neighborhood that you might be interested in at just as though you were living there. So you stay a week or so, or even a few days or uh, several places around town, you get a feeling for the neighborhoods. Airbnb, uh, that's the largest one. There are other ones like that on the um, internet. And uh, basically what you're doing is you're renting a room in someone's house or maybe even the whole house and uh, getting an idea of what the neighborhood is like. It's a great way to um, to get a feel for it. So meetup.com, uh, check out what people like you are doing, things like kayaking and softball leagues, uh, photography, board games, that sort of thing. Uh, and then Airbnb, Airbnb, B-N-B dot com. And um, so anyway, those are two good resources, which reminds me, we're thinking of doing, uh, we've been talking with some folks um, about designing a best places board game. And we thought that would be a lot of fun. It would be sort of maybe some elements of like um, uh, careers or risk, not about risk, but that's more of a, taking over a country or whatever. But uh, it would be, I think, a lot of fun and very educational where we could go ahead and say, you know, here's some of the differences. What would it be like to live in Chicago? What would it be like to 
uh, New York City, uh, live in Man Manhattan. Um, what are the sort of the trade-offs for each of those? There are trade-offs for all of them. So uh, we're thinking about board gaming. If you've got some suggestions for that, I'd love to hear it uh, because that would be uh, that'd be fun. Uh, Deb asks, what is Corvallis like, affordability and weather? Uh, it's in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Uh, Corvallis is a college town. It's about 70, 90 miles south of Portland. Um, it's very nice. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it is quiet um, and it's, it's fairly expensive. Jobs are hard to come by. I've heard uh, from professors who uh, would like their, their spouses would like to find a job and that's not always easy. Places around Corvallis are uh, much more affordable. Uh, Albany is a great place to look at. Uh, it's just a few miles away north uh, between uh, Salem and Corvallis. Uh, so Corvallis is great, um, but for a little bit more affordable, I would try Albany, Oregon. Um, John says I'm correct about the Continental Divide. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, looks like people are exchanging some really good information in our chat room. Uh, connected with this. That's great. Um, so I'm trying to think of what else I can go ahead and talk about. Um, John asks, can you speak of Mississippi Valley of Northwest Iowa, Southwest Wisconsin, Minnesota? I haven't talked about Minnesota, Minneapolis area or whatever, but the Minnesota area, well, first of all, winters are brutal. Uh, so for some people, that is a problem. Um, but uh, I think the people are wonderful. Uh, it's a very progressive part of the country. Uh, Portland, I think, has a lot um, in comparison, uh, compares very well with Minnesota. Uh, and uh, Denver is another one. It's, Denver is more conservative, but um, Denver, from a metro standpoint, is very close to Portland. And Minneapolis, as far as its sort of progressive attitude, and sort of the health of the people as well uh, is very close to, uh, to Portland. I think the Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis area, uh, southeast Minnesota uh, has a lot going for it. And um, Wisconsin, uh, you know, Iowa, talking about Iowa, I think there are a lot of great places to live in these areas in the Midwest that get overlooked um, and they're still very affordable. Interestingly, when you look at the health of the people in places like Iowa, um, it's they have the great the greatest longevity in the U.S. Um, when you look at that, I don't know whether it's genetics or something that they are doing, but for instance, Ames, Iowa has uh, I think the highest longevity uh, in the United States, and I don't don't quite know why, but they're doing something right. Maybe maybe they picked the right. Uh, the right uh, ancestors to have. Maybe there's something genetic there. But uh, the uh, uh, Northwest Iowa, Southwest Wisconsin, Southeast Minnesota, all that area, I think there has a lot going for it. Definitely worth a look at it. If you can take the weather, the Midwest weather can be kind of brutal, um, but uh, the economy is uh, coming back as well. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, I, I think that's, we're reaching about, we only have a couple of minutes left here. Um, but anyway, people uh, have been writing in. I think uh, this is really, really very helpful for me to think about different things and know what you're interested in. So this is a very, it's really been a positive experience for me. I just want to tell you, my site, bestplaces.net, please visit and Write something about where you live because you are the expert wherever you live. You know more about your neighborhood, your city than anybody else. And even though I try and keep up on what's happening out there and make some suggestions, you know more about where you live than anybody else. And what you can share with everyone else is so valuable. Um, and I know oh, one thing reading comments. A lot of comments are negative. That's because people live wherever they are. Uh, they know so much about it and they know there's so many good things 
that it's easy to overlook them and it's maybe kind of boring to say about all the good stuff. So often in the comments, people say the negative things because they stand out. Uh, I wouldn't take that too seriously. Um, just realize that every place has issues. So I guess we're at the end of our time. Uh, it's been a great hour. I can't believe a whole hour has gone by. Uh, I look forward to visiting you again soon. Thank you for all the comments. If I didn't, and I didn't reach a lot of what people have commented on, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that, um, but I will read through them and make notes, and I'll try and address them. I'm going to be doing this again in a month, and look on our site, bestplaces.net, for the exact day and the exact time. I think it's going to be the first Tuesday at noontime Pacific time and 3 o'clock uh, East Coast time. So hope to see you there. So um, I hope wherever you are, you're going to have a great month of August and uh, see you next month. Bye-bye.